Welcome to the Archer webinar in improving accessibility in training. Um, this webinar is designed to share what we have learned here in, at Archer in terms of improving accessibility, accommodating the needs of participants. And these um, bits and pieces of information that we've gathered hopefully are useful for beyond just providing training, they're useful in teaching, they're useful in just working day to day with colleagues and partners. Um, this has been compiled by myself and my colleague Claire Barris and we hope you find it useful. So just as an overview of why are we doing this, um, oh sorry, just to recap, sorry, what we're going to talk about today is why are we doing this, why are we doing this in terms of best practice, how it links into what's already known. We'll talk about some specific examples we've come up uh, uh, across in the Archer training. Um, where to find information, this is obviously the most useful thing for you. We'd also like information on how we can improve, so we're happy to receive questions and then ask them up at the end. So why are we doing this? Well, first of all, because we have to. The Equality Act 2010 specifies that in the UK, everybody should have equal access, regardless of who they are, what they are, any disability they have. There are nine protected characteristics that include your gender, your ethnicity, um, and where you're from, and any disabilities. If somebody comes under one of these protected characteristics, you have a legal obligation to ensure that that doesn't inhibit their participation. Obviously, we don't want to just worry about it from an Equality Act point of view from the legislation. It's just a good idea. We want to enable participation in our training, facilitate everybody taking part. So it's all about removing barriers and making it as easy as possible for everybody to get the most out of training. Just continuing to do things the way we've been doing it for decades is not the best way forward. We want to encourage new groups to come forward and participate in what we're doing. And therefore, sometimes it just requires us to think a little bit differently and do something new. If you're looking for information, you can go to the Edinburgh University website, which has a disability service, and there's lots of information there which is publicly available to people outside the University of Edinburgh on supporting students. And it's general, helpful information on what you can do, the adjustments that you might make. Um, there's lots and lots of information there. Most universities will have their own equivalent service and useful information. So if you're doing something within a university, please find out if you've got a disability service help desk who may be able to help you with specific requirements within your university. Um, the disability service that I've just put a link to on the previous slide includes information about physical disability, where you can find disabled rooms. Again, your own university should have a list of um, disabled access rooms. Sadly, despite being in 2015, there are often plenty of old buildings which aren't wheelchair accessible. But universities are large enough that there is an expectation as a publicly funded body that anybody who requires wheelchair access or equivalent has to have access. So just saying we're in an old building that doesn't have accessibility is not sufficient you will need to move your meeting or training or whatever event it is to an accessible room. There's also information on dealing with specific learning difficulties such as dyslexia, uh, working with people who are autistic or in the autistic spectrum, visual impairment, hearing impairment, and using various assistive technologies. There's a huge, huge range of information out there and there's no one size fits all. So the best thing to do is just have a look through the material, but then make accommodations as necessary. So I'm now going to go through a few examples that we've come across that um, are kind of particularly insightful because we like to think we're fairly well prepared here. We are trying our best. Um, and we ask people to tell us if there is any help that they need with anything. And yet we still come across a few things that have surprised us. It's very specific to doing the Archer courses in that people, we don't know the people that register before they turn up. They register online. Normally, we only contact them through email subsequently before the course. And then they turn up, and that's the first time we meet them. They turn up sometimes, they're from outside the University of Edinburgh. Sometimes we're not even doing the training at Edinburgh. In fact, the majority of our courses are not based in Edinburgh where we are based. So we're going to an outside institution. 
We don't necessarily know the venue particularly well. We're liaising with our local contact at that venue. This adds a layer of complexity to running courses. So there's one example that we came across. A course delegate had requested wheelchair access to a training venue that was not at the University of Edinburgh. We contacted the venue and they initially told us that there was event, the, the venue was not wheelchair accessible. However, when we did some further research, we found that actually the venue was wheelchair accessible. It was just through a strange access route. So we needed to provide the participant with separate instructions on how to find the venue. We needed to make sure they had additional time to get between uh, the, the various sections of the course, um, including making sure they have time for lunch and going for um, comfort breaks. And it just added a level of complexity that we'd not thought of before. We now specify whenever we're working with an outside partner that all of the venues must be wheelchair friendly because of this. A second similar example is an art share course delegate contacted the venue, not us, again it was not an Edinburgh University venue, to say that they had a badly broken leg and that they would require wheelchair access. We had told them a room and they asked the venue, is this room wheelchair friendly? The venue said yes it is, however in the meantime the venue was changed. Um, and this information didn't get to the delegate until they turned up on the morning of the course. And it turned out that the new venue was not wheelchair friendly. It was up a flight of stairs, uh, which is far from ideal. The catering and the toilet facilities were on a different floor where, from where the training was held. We couldn't sort this one out. What we should have done is insisted that the training did not move rooms. And we've learned from this. And now we will not allow changes unless the change allows for uh, dis disabled access. However, it's a very interesting experience in that the course delegate had decided not to talk to us about it, um, had, but had talked to the venue instead. On some level, there's not a lot we could do about it, but what we should be doing is encouraging people to talk to us. There's a, a lot of the time people do not want to put their hand up and say, hey, I've got a problem because it's another reason to flag themselves out as different and that's sometimes uncomfortable. So we need to work as hard as we can in all of this to try and encourage people to talk to us and then we can make sure that things are in place for them. One of the other problems we have is presenters not using microphones. Many of us fall foul of this, I think. Um, there may well be a microphone in the room but you think, you know, I can talk loud enough, it's not a problem. You ask people, can you hear me? But quite often when you ask that question, you ask in a louder voice than you would typically and then you gradually quieten down over the course of the event. Afterwards, um, in this particular event, a hearing impaired attendee complained to say that they could not follow the talks. But if they'd been if a microphone had been used, then they could have been linked up with an induction loop, which was present in the room. The best practice is always, always use a microphone. In most university buildings, microphones are now provided as standard in teaching rooms. So this shouldn't be a problem. And again, it's something that should be checked before a venue is decided upon. Another example we've come across is a visually impaired delegate requesting practical session handouts to be printed in a particular um, point size. In this case, it's 24 point text. This was all very last minute. Uh, so we weren't prepared for it. I think, in fact, they turned up and asked for it to be printed out. Normally, we'd be very, very happy to do this. However, the material had been prepared in LaTeX in a style file that was very long, and no one who was present on the day could quickly make changes to the style file to increase the font size. We did come up with an alternative solution, but the ideal is that you have materials prepared so you can easily provide printed information in different sizes, different fonts, different colors as required. So some general guidelines taking away from all of those examples. Try and ensure that all venues are all fully wheelchair accessible, regardless of whether or not anybody has asked at the time of booking. Given that your venue will be decided upon before you open registration generally for such training, it is very important. And also, Work with the venue to make sure that they don't move it without telling you and keeping everybody informed. 
We should also ensure that all venues for such training have induction loop facilities. Archer and the core training team now have access to a portable induction loop kit that we can take with us. Um, but it's also therefore essential that everybody uses a microphone. Another set of guidelines, make sure your material can be easily formatted to be resized, change colors, and um, generally produced a very short notice for a particular set of requirements. Working with external partners is often difficult. We have found this from time to time. When we host something at the University of Edinburgh, which is our home institution, we are bound by the university's policies. The university has the same legal obligations as every other university, but its obligation is to its own staff and students first. If we go to an external partner, they have to look after their students before the external partner, especially as a lot of the time we are not paying for the venue, they are donating it to us. Therefore, if it's term time and all the venues are full and we've been put in a room that is not wheelchair accessible, it's often very difficult for the university to move us to a wheelchair friendly room if all their wheelchair friendly rooms have been taken up by teaching of their own students. Therefore, you need to work with them from day one, as soon as you know you're going to run a course there, to make sure everything is successful, which is why at Archer we've now implemented a policy that all of our courses are only held in wheelchair accessible venues. One of the key things we all need to do is to make it very clear that we are willing to provide accommodations and changes as necessary. It's quite hard to do at times. You need to ask in such a way that they don't feel that they can't tell you, that you're not going to judge them before they turn up, and particularly that it's not going to restrict them from saying if they think it's linked to their ability to actually be registered on the course. All of the Archer courses are free to attend, and aside from too many people registering, we never turn down a registration. But there may well be a perception that you cannot attend a course if you, you put something in your request that makes it difficult for it. So the best thing is to disassociate asking for changes from your actual registration. In our training, we also use something called Hackpad, which is a great tool for sharing information between delegates. It's just a great tool anyway, but it particularly removes barriers from attendees that are a bit reluctant to put up their hand and ask a question. It's very useful when you've got anybody who isn't following, perhaps because they can't hear properly or uh, the, it's not being clear. It's great for a, a trainer to share information as well, you know, a last minute URL that you need to share with your attendees. Skype chat is a great way to have discrete one-to-one -one communication with delegates and tutors in the course. So if you've got anybody who's a little bit shy, it's a great way to lower the barriers so they feel they can ask your questions. The most important thing to take away from this is to try and open a conversation between attendees and the tutors before starting the course. Even if you've had a registration form that asks for people to provide requests for changes, accommodations, if you've actually spoken to the attendees even via email before the course starts, they're far more likely to actually discuss with you their accessibility requirements. Far more powerful than just having a form with a faceless person on the other end receiving it. I'm now going to go over a few guidance for some specific disabilities. The first one is for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. One in five people now have some form of hearing impairment. That's a very large percentage of the people that turn up to our training. Many people lip read, some very well. Many people don't know they lip read until the person that they're lip reading turns their back and they realize they don't follow as well. Many of us will do it without really noticing that we do. Instead, we'll blame it on somebody mumbling because they've turned their back on it. You may well also find that for somebody who's deaf, that they use sign language, gestures, writing, language interpreters. It's really important in this situation to understand how they're going to communicate with you and accommodate it in the way you teach. If a student brings along an interpreter, make sure you talk to the student, not the interpreter. The interpreter will spend a long time, you know, the student will look at the interpreter for the majority of the time, but you should be talking to the student, not the interpreter. During discussions, ensure one person speaks at a time. This allows anybody in the room 
to turn and face the person who is asking a question or answering a question and lip read or the interpreter to interpret what they're actually saying. This is often difficult to do when you've got a very lively discussion going on, but it's something that's very important to try and explain. One way around this, particularly if you don't have a microphone for every single person in the room, is to try and repeat the questions, repeat comments, so that there's time for anybody who's not heard the full question to pick up what's going on. You can normally build this into the actual answer, so you're not just repeating everything word for word, which sometimes becomes quite monotonous and people are reluctant to do. Try not to lose visual contact. Uh, definitely avoid giving out information while handing out papers or turning your back and talking while you're white, writing on a blackboard or a whiteboard. As far as possible, always make sure there are a few seats near the front that are left for anybody who needs to be near you. This may be for people with deaf or hard of hearing or it may be for something else. If you're using videos, always caption them whenever possible. At Archer, we are currently working on how to do this, and we hope to share best practice with you at some point in the future. If you must darken the classroom, ensure that the student interpreter is clearly visible. That's really, really important, otherwise they can't participate in the discussion. When reading from text, always provide a copy in advance for top participants. We at Archer always provide all of, all of our slides at least 24 hours before every single course. People can download them and have a look through them before the course starts. This is very, very important for anybody who has um, any deaf or hard of hearing impairments that require them to have an extra person in the room. If they've already looked over the slides, they can spend more time looking at the interpreter. When you're working with chalkboard or overhead system and you've got a student who's got an interpreter, pause briefly to allow the student to look at the screen and actually take in what's on the screen and then look at you or the interpreter. Students with mobility impairment. Again, there are some best practices similar to all of these um, impairments. Make sure the space for them at the front of the room is necessary. There may well be a wide variety of impairments from crutches, braces, wheelchairs, to somebody who's just not very mobile. There might not be anything particularly obvious, but they've asked that the room is accessible and doesn't require stairs. They may well use a dictaphone to record lectures so they can go over them later, because sometimes uh, people with physical limitations can't attend the entire session. Don't forget, if somebody's in a wheelchair, that the wheelchair is part of the person's personal space. Do not lean on it, touch it, sit on it, push it. A lot of people really want to help out and will push a wheelchair, but you should only ever do this when asked, because it is part of their personal space. When talking to a student, the ideal is to get down onto their level. So always try and take a seat if you're going to have a conversation with them. Understand that they may be late. Ideally, we will change timetables to make sure there's plenty of time to get between rooms. But anybody with mobility impairment and somebody who's not obviously impaired may well have some form of mobility impairment that just makes them late. Never assume why they're late. You have no idea why. Be prepared to make special seating arrangements. Again, this is very important. The last thing these people want to do when they come in late is to make a fuss to clear some space at the front of the room. The ideal is that there is just space there for them. Another key one, which we come across more in teaching our students here at the University of Edinburgh than in ARCH training, is dealing with students with psychological disabilities. These are hidden disabilities. Every single one is different. We're talking about depression, bipolar disorder, severe anxiety, but much, much more. These are poorly understood by society, and generally, many people think they aren't well accepted. So you may well find, whether it's attendees at a course or attendees for student attendees in your undergraduate teaching program, they will not tell you a lot of the time because they fear the reaction they will get. They won't want to disclose this information with you. You should never express your students to explain their disabilities if they do not wish to. But therefore, because you don't know exactly what's going on with every single person in your class, never judge a student for missing class, for being late, for leaving the room in the middle of the class. They know they are responsible for catching up, but they'll also appreciate if you can help them with that. 
but never ever judge them if you don't know what's actually going on. Visual disability. As we've already discussed, we had a case here where we weren't easily able to print out slides at a larger um, print font. So make sure it's easy to change the font size, to magnify the information as required. Again, you may want to need to provide seating near the front of the room, so then near the slides and the lecturer. And once more, as best practice, you should be providing the slides and notes in advance. Avoid making statements that cannot be followed by somebody without sight, especially things like this diagram sums up what I've been saying. Instead, try saying this line on this plot goes from the bottom left corner to the top right corner and it shows whatever it shows. It's difficult to do, but it will make it a lot better for everybody in the room, not just the person that's visually impaired. Just to sum up, general best practice. Ensure there is plenty of time for breaks. Late start and early finish is often beneficial. This is also true for people that have care and responsibilities. Start communication with the participants early on, well before the course starts. This is really, really important when you're running a one-off course and you don't know the participants you are far more likely to find out their requirements well in advance and allow you time for preparation if you've made it easy for them to communicate with you. A faceless form does not do that well. These people have often spent a large portion of their life trying to put up their hands and say, I'm different, and they don't want to be. So make it easy for them to say how you can help them. If possible, always provide catering. This is now difficult to do in the modern day because we're all having tightened budgets. But if you can provide catering, it makes it a lot easier for anybody who's mobility impaired to attend um, and as they don't have to go further away to get food. It also provides excellent networking opportunities and actually has been shown to broaden participation from underrepresented groups because they feel they're more likely to get something out of the course if they have the opportunity to network. Be considerate. Realize that Participants are under no obligation to tell you their requirements. This can make it difficult for you and sometimes frustrating when somebody turns up and says, can I have X, Y, and Z, and you're like, I needed a week to prepare for that. So we need to make it easy for them to tell us, but we cannot force them to. You're only expected to help if you've been told. As I said, it is frustrating because we all want our students to get the best out of a course. But it does mean that the best thing is to make sure they have as many different ways as possible to tell you what they need. As I've already said, kids don't assume anything about someone's behavior. You don't know what's going on in their lives. It's very easy for us to jump to snap conclusions about somebody being grumpy or late or falling asleep. But we actually have no idea what's been going on, what their life is like outside this course. So please don't judge people because of the way we think they're behaving when there may well be a very different explanation. Being late, having a bad day may not be their fault. Also be aware that many people will just make do because they don't want to be seen to making fuss. We need to work to reassure them that we want to help and act that way ourselves when we need our help or too. We would also like to know what else we should be doing at Archer to improve training, to make it as accessible as possible, to ask these difficult questions, what can we do for you? So if you have any information for us, please contact the Archer Help Desk and let us know. Do be aware that getting the information is difficult, as I've already mentioned. There is no one size fits all. You can't just make some changes and accommodate everybody overnight. We have tried to make sure all our slides are generally accessible. But there will be many people who, for whom it is not perfect. One of the other things that you should be asking, it's not a legal requirement, but it is best practice, is to ask for things such as dietary requirements. It's not a protected characteristic, but if food is not provided for one person or two people in a course, but it is for everybody else, particularly if they had assumed that food would be provided for them, they either go hungry, which means they're not going to get as much out of course, or they end up having to go off somewhere else to find food, excluding them from the networking events and also potentially making them late, especially as for special dietary requirements such as dairy-free and gluten-free, local small outlets and universities often aren't able to cater for them. They may well have to go for a very long way in order to find some food that's appropriate. If you are offering 
dietary requirements, please make sure that they are fulfilled. The worst thing is to tell somebody that they will have a special meal turning up and then it doesn't turn up. So just to sum up, please make sure that you're aware of the UK Equality Act, actually regardless of if you're involved in training. There are a lot of obligations on every single person living and working in the UK to be well behaved and take into consideration people that are just different from us. That includes whether or not you are a different gender from them or whether or not they are just from a different background than you. The UK Equality Act makes sure that everybody is aware of this information, that they have a legal responsibility to take into account. Find out what facilities are already available for you at your university. And also find out where to get help from Feather Red Life. At Archer, we are happy to share with you what we are doing, and we hope that this lecture has been useful. And if you have anything to contribute, we'd be happy to work with you and include it in our best practice. Thank you very much. Has anybody got any questions? Okay, thank you.